Hey guys, Bradley Hall here. Really appreciate every single one of y'all being here. This is another video in the process series. If it's your very first time you're here, if you watch this one, you really like it. There's a couple more before it. Um, this will be video number three in the process series. I told you guys I was going to sit down and really reflect on my year last year. And that's what this one's going to be is the reflection of the things that I did right, the things that I did wrong, um, going through the events of ways that I can improve and get better for 2022 to possibly um, do a better job of accomplishing all of my goals that I have set for 2022. So um, guys, this is going to be real short and sweet. I've got a big notebook full of notes here. I spent a lot of time thinking about this. Really appreciate all the feedback that I've gotten from the last two videos. They haven't been the most high viewed videos that I've ever put out, but they dang sure have a, a lot of comments that come back and a lot of support, a lot of ideas. Um, can't tell y'all how much I really appreciate those. So let's uh, let's get to reflection of 2021 and let's talk about some of the things that I did wrong and some of the things I did right and where we're going to head different in 2022. All right, guys, I'm going to start right off the chain here with Harris Chain. Um, I didn't know how else to do it, but just to list the tournaments that I fished and then go back in my mind and refresh the things that I did there. Um, mistakes that I made, mistakes. Hopefully some of these will come up as repetitive throughout the season. And those will be the ones that I really highlight at the end and go, okay, you know, going into next year, what can we do different? Um, Harris Chain was the very first tournament of the year. Um, I finished 145th at the very first event. So it was not a very successful way to start off um, the year of 2021 trying to qualify for the elites. Basically, it shoots you dead. Um, you're not going to make it through the Southern Division when you finish that way. And then it really puts you way behind the eight ball in the overall so it was not a good way to start although it wasn't the end of the world and i realized that upshaw had done the same thing the year before felt really bad about it i told him dude just keep grinding by the end of the year he was back in it like it was possible but this is not how i want to start 2022 um fortunately hopefully a little prayer little fingers crossed and uh doing some of this stuff that we're doing right here today will help me prevent myself from doing that again next year um, the biggest mistake that I made at Harris Chain, honestly, was a pretty honest mistake. Um, it was the first tournament of the year. It's cold up here in Oklahoma. Uh, I've been cooped up all winter, and you want to go fishing. And I was ready to go. I had rented the house um, in Florida on the Harris Chain. I had a certain part of the lake that I really wanted to focus on. It was my game plan. Um, it was down on Lake Apopka. And... I even, like I said, I even rented the house that, I, that we stayed in that was down there by that, 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 that lake and went ahead and packed everything up and I leave here and there wasn't a lot of thought process went into this, but we get down there early, get a hotel room, pop in it and I'm like, hey man, we're right here by Lake Griffin, let's fish here for a day or two because I had gone so early that I had two or three days over the top of what I would normally spend my three to four days of practice and it was basically just to get me out of the house, and I shouldn't have done that. I should have stopped anywhere except on that chain of lakes because I never had any intention whatsoever to go to Griffin. And long story short, by the end of it, you catch some bass up there, it takes me away from what I really want to do. Even though I spent time on my game plan, it just wasn't enough. And looking back, I don't know how it wasn't enough. Um, they were the right size fish. I still end up going to Griffin. And it was never in my game plan before I left house. It was, it, it's not my style. It's, 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 it's clear up there that time of year. It's a lot of grass. It's a lot of offshore hydrilla fishing. And quite frankly, a pompka was a bunch of flipping and they were on the reeds on the bank. So I really messed up. And that's one thing that we're gonna really watch out for. And like I say, it was an honest mistake. I went down there early and, and that really hurt me. Another thing was, is that my roommates all of my roommates ended up in Griffin. It was a big conversation in the house every night about how many bites everybody was getting. And I think that in itself hurt me as well. Um, I don't know if you call it doc talk or not, really when you share information with that close of friends, but it still got in my head and it wasn't anything that I needed to hear. Now, that lesson helped me going forward throughout the season because I really paid attention to that because the very next event was Douglas. And there was a lot of that going on there as well. Those guys were fishing for those smallmouth. Um, 
everybody's coming in at night talking about getting 30, 40 bites, and I stuck with my guns on that one. Um, some of the things that I did right at Harris Chain, really the only positive that I could take away from that, that terrible finish was my backup plan did generate some bites. I had some backup stuff um, on the next leg down, and I would come through there at the end of the day because I'd caught absolutely basically nothing on Griffin and <clears throat> would pick up some fish. The problem was, was that the size was just not big enough to help carry me further than 145th. Um, it, was, it was bad. And anyway, Douglas was the second event of the year. Um, Douglas was Highland Reservoir. It was during the spawn. Um, I had found some fish uh, that were more my style, but the problem was the water was high and was putting some wood in the water that no longer was accessible as the water was following, and that was the problem. When I first got there, the water was, was up enough, and as the water would fall each day, and I'm not talking about an inch, I'm talking six inches a day, it was taking over the course of three or four days, it took a couple of feet of water out from places that I was getting bit that were already shallow. Um, one of the mistakes that I made there was, is I kind of had a little group of fish gathered up, um, and I really thought about, hey, where are these fish going to go? And I thought I had it figured out. There was a little road bed there um, that was offshore that was still shallow that I really thought that's where they'd migrate and jump up to. But there ended up being a little ditch in there that uh, those fish really ended up getting in those ditch and uh, in that ditch. And uh, one of my competitors um, got got the best of that, no doubt. Um, he, he had a better event than I did. But with all that being said, I had a little backup area. Uh, there were some fish spawning there. I caught a couple of nice bed fish day one and day two. Sight fish at the end of the day each day that, that kind of carried me through, and I ended up finishing 35th there. So good enough for a check and making some points, and dang sure better than the 145th that I'd posted uh, the event before. The third event was Pickwick. Um, it's a TVA place. It's something that I really enjoy, TVA impoundments. Um, the mistakes that I made there... <laughs> It took me a while to really get on some fish, and I spent a day, day and a half of practice that I really, it took me too long. And um, once I did figure it out, it was pretty plain and simple. I spent most of my time out on the river, on the main river, uh, fishing grass. I caught most of them on that little crankbait that you guys saw me throwing, just cranking grass, spinnerbaiting grass, chatterbaiting grass. Um, really, they were post spawners. And <clears throat> I had a couple of places that um, one of them I tried to stop on the first day. Now you gotta realize in practice, I don't know how good some of these areas are. I get a couple of bites off of them and I, I just move on. Um, and then I come back in the tournament and kind of feel around and then kind of learn more about how good a, a little area is. And I had one that I wanted to start on the first day, really not because it was better, but just because it was kind of first in line if I was gonna start here on the river and work my way up. And there was a boat there where he stopped about the same time I did. Um, I stopped, he stopped, he was closer to really the sweet spot on it. Um, I just went ahead and put it on pad and went on. I didn't come back at all the rest of the first day. And so it was a rat boat and I don't know who it was. And Panger and I had this conversation years ago. I would know who everyone was because he kind of does. And I really don't. I, don't. I don't pay enough attention to the standings and the names. Um, like you do when you're younger. And <clears throat> so at the end of this day, this is my point, I don't know who I'm fishing around really. And so when you look at the standings, you don't really know what the capability is that's being caught around you. And I, I do think that that's, I mean, that's one thing that can help you. I'm not saying that you go over and get on top of the guy's hole that caught 20 pounds yesterday. That's not what I'm getting at. But it lets you know what is available in that overall, you know, one mile, two mile section uh, that's being caught out of there. <clears throat> so going forward that'll be at the end of this video but that's one thing that we're definitely going to look at i didn't know who it was and then the second day of the event <clears throat> I, I didn't start there um, i went on up and, and fished some of the places that i'd been bit on the day before and try to expand on that long story short at the end of the day i come back with you know it's not the end of the day but there's probably three hours left in the day and i come back to this this spot and or this little area and dude it's, it's, it's a school that you're looking for on TVA. And I get the swim bait out and the crank baits out and go to work on them and it ends up salvaging my tournament, um, which left me with a 26th place finish at Pickwick. So now we're starting to get some momentum. Um, Pickwick was the very first event of the Central Division. 
which had Grand Lake on the schedule at the end of the year, so it was a good way to start. Um, <clears throat> the positives to uh, what happened at Pickwick, really one of the biggest positives that I could pull away from was there was, there was part of that river system that I wasn't really sure how the seasonal migrations worked right there during the spawn, but I think I figured that out. And I'm not gonna go into detail about that, but it was a more complicated part of the system. It's a main river run system. There's not a lot of backwaters in this area. <clears throat> so I wasn't really sure, you know, where, where are these bass spawning? Because you really gotta understand that to understand where they're gonna move back to. So like, you gotta understand their spawning spots. You gotta understand where they, where they summer so that you can kind of intersect them in between when they're moving from, from their winter spot to, to, to where they're gonna spawn and then from their spawn back to wherever their summer spot is, and it may or may not be the same as winter, depending on what fishery we're talking about, but that migrational movement's important to understand to help you target higher percentage areas whenever you're bass fishing. Anyway, I think I, I, think I figured that out uh, for this particular section of Lake Pickwick. Um, <clears throat> going forward, uh, the next event, the next event <clears throat> was the James River. And the James River was my worst finish of the entire year. Um, it was the best practice of the entire year. And I can tell you from years of experience of doing this that that is common for a lot of guys and it's extremely common for me. And <clears throat> it really gets down to that whole not having an open mind thing. The, the, the better something works in practice, the more confident you become in it to the point where you're just like, I'm gonna do this and I'm not gonna do anything else because this has the amount of bites I need, this has the size I need. And then when tournament day comes, you're not in there for an hour and go, this didn't work and let's go try something else. You continue to grind and honestly, it takes four, five, six hours go by and you're like, well, maybe the next spot, maybe the next spot, maybe the next spot. And the next thing you know, you've dug a hole so deep that you can't get out of it. And that's exactly what happened to me at the James River. Um, the second day, I just went to a whole different part of the river that I'd never even seen, and I did that on purpose because I didn't want to get stuck in that mindset of trying to do some of the things that I'd tried to reproduce before. I think that those fish were spawning. I couldn't see them. I, I was pretty sure that those fish were spawning there. It was a flipping bite for me, and <clears throat> I think that they just left the beds. For whatever reason, those females weren't there anymore, and they had been there for three or four days leading up to that, and they had done their deal and had left, gave up the ghost, and, and, and I had a bad finish because of it. The biggest thing that I learned coming away from there was is that I really saw another part of the river that I really hadn't allowed myself to see during practice, so I didn't cover enough water. That was, was one of the mistakes in practice. Got too locked into a pattern, and then didn't expand on something else once I had kind of a pattern established. And so what I learned from the second day of that tournament, which will help me going forward, is, is that a lot of that river system really suits me well. Um, I definitely got, like we went into two or three different areas on day two and I really understood them. Like I got it. Um, I got lucky and drew a local angler there that's a pretty good fisherman there. And we just kind of bounced around some stuff he wanted to look at. And and like, I, I, I understand there's more to that system than just where I was in that tournament. So. I look forward to going back. I, I think that I'll have a good event on the James. Um, we're going a couple of weeks or a week earlier or something. So it'll be around the spawn again, um, just like it was last year. But um, like I said, it, it's got the watercolor. It looks like a river, you know, it really does. So um, I like it and understand it going forward. <clears throat> the next event for me was Lake Oneida. Um, Lake Oneida, I finished 51st at Oneida, which is not a good finish. It's not a great finish by no means. Um, they only pay top 40 spots, so you're not getting a check. But it is a decent finish in the AOY as far as looking at the overalls. Now the problem that I'm up against at this point when I leave this event is that I've got 151st place in one of them and 145th place in the other one. So those two combined, I'm needing better than 51st to crawl back up with only three events left, um, maybe four of, of the open. So I've really dug myself in a hole here. but. Um, I really stuck to my guns at Oneida. Um, I didn't I didn't try to force something. I, I really just kind of fished my style. There's largemouth on that place. I've been there numerous times. I like it. 
there's some good fish on that place. They're hard to catch. You don't catch very many of them, but they count when you catch one. So that's really what I kind of went after. Um, a thing that I missed there, um, there's a current deal there. And if any of you guys are watching this that happen to live on Lake Oneida or have quite a bit of experience about it, I actually asked a couple of guys at the way in and they really didn't understand what I was talking about. But there's a current situation there and I don't know what makes it come, what makes it go. You know, there's, there's, they got the little locking dams and stuff and the canals of the Erie Canal, but there's, there's definitely a switch there that gets turned on when that current's moving. And I saw that in practice, I experienced it. And that window was really special. I don't know when it comes and when it goes. That's my problem. So one of my big things looking for next year is because we are coming back to Oneida, um, I would really like to understand why, when, and where um, that could really help me. Along with another deal that I saw right off the bat out in the grass, this is more of a smallmouth deal. And, and I noticed it right off the bat um, when I was there and I spent quite a bit of time looking for it, um, some rock piles and stuff. and and. And I really think I understood it. I was like, man, this has got to be the deal. And then I just couldn't put two and two together. I think I understand that a little bit more as well. Um, I did not target smallmouth at all during that event. And with Oneida kind of firing the way that it does, I really think that, that spending some time focusing on generating some smallmouth bites could really help me there. Um, the largemouth population is not what it once was from years ago when I had been there. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. The smallmouth are bigger and they play a bigger part. Um, I definitely want to spend some time there in practice with spending time for smallmouth that I didn't do this year. And like I said, when I leave this event, after my finishes, I start looking at the points and the overall AOY. Could I still mathematically make it? Maybe. Um, I would basically have to. I just did the math from the year before, and I basically would have to have like a top 10 finish in every single event that was left on the uh, calendar and I didn't see that being a realistic deal with the amount of field size and everything that we got going plus one of them was in St. Lawrence um, in upstate New York which is on the Canadian border um, place that I'd never been it was easy to make that call we still had two division two, two, two tournaments left in the central division um, I had finished 26th in the first one we had one in Alabama coming up, and then we were going to finish in Oklahoma. There was a lot of light at the end of that tunnel, so I don't regret making that decision whatsoever. Um, saved me a few thousand dollars on top of that with uh, just not having the costs and expenses of driving to New York and Lake Norman being a long way from where I live. So I, I don't regret those two decisions at all to, to not go to those. Plus, it allowed me a little more time to really focus on Lewis Smith because – I felt like if I put in my time at Lewis Smith, I could probably make something work there and then I'd allow me to come home to Oklahoma and have a chance to possibly qualify for the Elite Series. So we go to Lewis Smith and um, I started off down lake with the with Lewis Smith's uh, Blueback Herring Lake. And I, I spent some time down there the first couple of days that I was there uh, focusing on that bite because I do enjoy blueback herring fishing. I do. I really do. I like spending time with my live scope. I like it offshore. I understand it. I get it. And I had some bites down there. I was successful with it. <clears throat> I was concerned about the boat pressure. Um, I just felt like that for me, it wasn't quite, and I hadn't given up on it, but it just wasn't worth the direction that I really, I didn't feel real strong about it. So the next day of practice, I go up one of the rivers, which there's rivers all over that place, but I go up one of the rivers and I start getting bit pretty good with a jig on docks. And uh, they weren't big fish, like it wasn't anything I was ever gonna win. But I was generating some bites, and anytime I'm swinging that jig around cover, um, it gives me confidence that a big bite could come at any point in given time. But I definitely liked the amount of bites that I was getting um, on a spotted bass lake and doing something that was really in my comfort zone. So I continued to expand on that throughout the practice, but I never once, now I tried a whole lot of top water stuff, I tried a whole lot of moving crank and different stuff. But I never really focused on trying some more finessey stuff around some of the same places that I was getting bit with that jig. And when the event starts, the first day of the event, I catch like, I don't know, I have like eight or nine, ten keeper bites, quite a few, maybe
maybe more. And uh, I, I finished day one of the event. I'm in 15th place, which is perfect. It's right where I need to be, somewhere in the top 20, um, with a shot to go home to Oklahoma and have a chance to make the elites. Um, the second day of the event, we kick off a little bit of delay for fog delay, like I've talked about, I think, in the video before here. This is where the mistake comes in. I spend the entire day doing the same thing on different parts of the lake. I didn't just go right back to everything that I'd caught. I tried some of those places and I had felt like going into it that, hey, this will probably be a one day deal. You catch these fish, you need to move to another section. And so I kind of did that and started moving around, but I still could not freaking generate bites. And I was not aggravated by it, but I just, I felt confident and I just kept that jig in my hand and I kept working. It wasn't until I was driving home that I really got to thinking, you know, if you'd have slipped a shaky head or Ned rig or drop shot, a wacky worm, something, in some of those same areas that I was fishing with that jig during that day, I think I could have caught a couple more keepers. And a couple more keepers when it was all said and done was all I needed um, at the end of the year. So it didn't come to my brain at all until I was driving home. When I was driving home from the events, when I thought about this, it, it never crossed my mind once during the day. Um, I only weighed in one fish the second day for two and a half pounds, which was a good fish for that place, but uh, there was a lot left on the table. And when it was all said and done and you're four, four and a half pounds out of making <clears throat> the elites at the end of the year and you only weighed in one of possible five, and really what it boiled down to was the fact that I didn't have one tied on laying on my deck. It's that simple. It's not that I don't like spinning rods, don't enjoy them, I do. Um, but anyway, you get the idea. Um, never tried it. So we get to Grand Lake. Grand Lake, quite honestly, is <clears throat> the worst practice that I had probably all year. Definitely one of the worst practices I've had on Grand in the fall. It was tough. Um, I ended up finishing 12th at Grand. I missed the top 10 cut by a half pound. And I only weighed in for the, the four keepers the, uh, the second day. Now they were good fish, obviously, to finish that high and not even have a limit. But uh, this really brings me to the biggest mistake that I probably made all year. I had the worst practice at Grand for three or four days there. And I went into that event as confident as I ever did any other event that I fished this year no self-doubt whatsoever like i was going to catch some bass i'm not going to win the tournament or anything like that it's not how i'm thinking but i'm going to catch some fish and they're going to know i'm here if i would have fished all the other events <laughs> in practice and with that type of no self-doubt like it's going to happen believe like i should um I think it changes a lot of things. It changes a lot of things in practice. It changes a lot of things in the tournament. So that kind of leads me into the things that I'm going to do different next year. And that one is the biggest mistake that I think that I made the entire year. And it's, it's self-doubt, man. That's what it is. It's uh, second guessing. It's, it's, I don't know how you explain it. We all go through it as fishermen, but um, it's not a high level of it. But I'm telling you, at Grand, the first morning at takeoff, when I stopped on my first spot, which I hadn't seen um, at any point in practice, <coughs> it's not some secret hole, guys. I mean, it's just a bank like everybody else, and it's pretty close to takeoff. And I had five keepers in the boat by 10.30 in the morning. And, I mean, I was struggling to get two or three bites a day in practice. I never had any self-doubt. And it's confidence from years of being there and understanding things, yes. Confidence from having success there, yes. But hey, I've been to a lot of these other places we went to this year too, and I've had success there as well. It's not the same type of confidence. And um, whatever I've got to do, whether it's preparation, different things, but definitely I'm going to keep that in check uh, going forward. Um, so number one next year, definitely no self-doubt. Um, I want a little bit more structured practice. I don't want to slip in somewhere too early um, like I did at uh, Harris Chain this year to start the year off. Um, I need, I've got on my schedule, I think I'm going to practice four days. That's what I'm going to practice, period, end of story. Um, I don't want more than that, and quite honestly, four is a lot. Um, I want to know what's going on right now, right then, not what was going on before that. 
So a little bit more structured practice. Um, I want to expand on patterns. I want to expand past the patterns that I establish. So like this is to avoid that whole closed minded part. No matter how good something is that you find in practice, I want to continue to look for new things, something totally different. If you're getting bit on bluff walls, then go find something on flats. If you're getting bit on chunk rock, go find something on sand. That's kind of what I mean. So instead of just bumping, 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 doing the same thing, same thing, getting by it, getting by it, getting by it, getting more confident in what you're doing, at some point there, pretty, pretty early on, I'm going to nip that in the bud and go do something else. Um, focusing on the points of individual divisions. So I know for a fact that the last two years, I'm really looking at that overall AOY. I did focus on the centrals quite a bit just because it had an Oklahoma Lake in it this year. I thought that it had a good chance to start off with. I really focused on the points in there and then the outcome was I finished ninth in the points. Now you finish ninth in the points in all three divisions, which I'm not saying a guy can just do that by focusing only, but I need to think about each tournament. So like you don't show up in Florida the first one of the year and go, hey, I've got nine of these, I've got room to make errors. There's no room for error. Like you need to focus on these three tournaments that are in the Southerns, these three in the Northerns, and these three in the Centrals. So you kind of get that idea. Um, be prepared with all options possible, tied on, tied on, tied on is the deal here. So preparation needs to be done more so at home. Um, I'm a really bad about showing up to a lake. I've got seven rods laying on the deck to begin practice with seven different baits. And by the end of practice, I've got the same seven rods laying up there with basically, you know, with five of the same seven that I had tied on the first day I got there. So um, really for me, it's just about rigging up more rods um, because I'm not likely to sit down and go through a tackle box and tinker. I told you guys, that's just not how I work. I generally try to find an area with more aggressive fish and then try to figure out how to catch them as the tournament develops. But what's happening to me is like what happened at a little conversation that we had, what happened to me at uh, what happened to me at Smith Lake, um, I didn't adjust to a spinning rod. And it, it basically boiled down to the fact that I hadn't been bit on the dang thing. So it didn't cross my mind. In practice, there's no pressure. You're free, you're free flowing, your mind's flowing much better. Um, that's the time to pick it up and try. And then, then you can kind of learn, hey, this cricket's a little better than that cricket, or this cricket's as good, or if they don't eat this one, maybe they'll eat this one. Point being, I need them rigged up. I need them laying on my deck, or at least in my rod box, rigged up and ready to rock and roll every single event. <clears throat> and there was probably one, honestly, in that rod box then, and I just didn't even pull it out. So going through the motions of that needs to happen more often for me next year. Um, I want to study the field more. I'm going to spend some off season, off this off season, spending some time on the line, looking at results from last year, putting a face and a rat to who everyone is. Um, like we talked about at Pickwick, I just wasn't sure of who all I was around and who I was sharing holes with. The guy may have won the dang tournament off of it. I don't think that's the case, but I want to know who's around me. Um, I want to take advantage of that. Um, I want to avoid fishing close-minded. Um, that's probably one of the biggest things I'm going to take away from this. Um, my worst finish of the year was definitely, really my two worst finishes of the year were some of my better practices, uh, Florida and, and, and the James River. And I want to avoid that closed-mindedness that other things don't exist because they always exist. If you guys have been watching my Conger videos, we just did one with Brian New. That was his biggest advantage of, of fishing out of the back of the boat is they have no control of where the boat stops. So wherever it stops, whatever's in front of you, how do I catch a bass right here, right now with the conditions that are presented to me? And he uses that to this day on the front of the boat. And I agree, I do too, but I want to take it to another level. So really maximizing what's in front of me, keeping an open mind that you can get a bite off of anything that's around you instead of only been getting bit on bluff walls or only been getting bit off flats. I need to get rid of that because each day is different <clears throat> and it doesn't take long for them to give you the sign when you hit the right spot. And what I mean by sign is it doesn't take long to get a bite or something when you start doing the right thing. And that thing changes all the time. It's a live, it's a live animal. So that's one thing. And then I think the last thing that I really learned this year 
is, and I talked about in the last videos, is I think that we're probably going to do a co-angler situation where I find a guy to travel with, um, young and energetic and wants to get after this, um, probably pick three different ones, one for each division. So um, that's something we'll have coming forward. Uh, I had some guys already reach out to me. I'm not making any decisions right now. Um, but that is something that I'm definitely going to look at. Um, having somebody just to practice with, to wake up in the morning that's ready to rock and roll and kind of help me with my, my motivation throughout the season because it is a long year and uh, that's pretty much it. So I've sit here and gone through all my stuff with you guys. Um, I enjoy putting it out here on the video too because it kind of holds me accountable. You guys hold me accountable. Um, if it's your first time here, guys, don't forget, bump that like, hit that subscribe. Can't thank y'all enough for all the feedback. Any other ideas you guys have on improvements, throw them my way. Hope this helps you with your fishing, your off season, and we'll have more coming with the process series.